welcome to Thrive Talks, the podcast covering all things to do with sustainability, thrivability, and the important policy changes happening around the world. Hi, I'm Rebecca from the Thrive Project, the not-for-profit tech and research forum, and I'll be your host as we talk with our experts and special guests about all the thrivability matters affecting the world today. This week, we're talking with our guest, Sunil Shastri, and he's an international consultant and expert on ocean and environmental governance. So, hi, Sunil. Hi. Thank you, Sam. Thank you, Rebecca, for having me. And I'm delighted to be uh, on Strive and Thrive, I think, for the second time now. Yeah. And uh, it's, it's a great pleasure and an honor. And I thank you. And I thank Boris for, for having me. Thank of you. Of course. We're very glad to have you. Now, you've said on uh, your website, I've seen, that our whole thinking must change. With regards to our oceans, how do we need to start thinking differently about them? Okay. Now, that, that's, that's a very good starting point because you use the, words, o- the word oceans and you're talking about dealing with them or how to deal with them or how to work with them and stuff like that. And that's where the, the thinking has to change. You know, okay. you, you, have to, you have to think of ocean as one ocean. In fact, now there is a, recently there's a, there's a new map of the ocean circulating and that shows the ocean as just one entity. So it's all interconnected. You know, unlike land masses, which are mostly connected in Eurasia particularly, but mm-hmm. Australia where you are is a separate land mass or, or United States or North America and South America, so in, you, even where I, I normally live, the United Kingdom, is a separate landmass, whereas ocean is not like that. The ocean is only one entity; it's all interconnected. So that's the first thinking. That so when I say our whole thinking has to change, that's where the change starts. So what I want you to do is just um, can you explain to me how are we all related or rely upon? The- Let's take some basic things. You know, I mean, most of us are what what I call as land lovers. You know, and I don't use that term in a pejorative or a derogatory way at all. It's just that. The ocean is out of sight, out of mind. You know, even people, I mean, people who live inland have literally nothing to do throughout with the ocean throughout their life because they probably never even go to the ocean, particularly in a large country or something like that. But even if you're in a coastal zone or in the coastal area where you're probably visiting the sea every so often or literally you're seeing the sea every day, but the problem is that you never get to see the sea beyond your line of sight yep. so even on the clearest day and even if, even from a vantage point one can see only about three nautical miles of the sea because the curvature of the earth and the horizon takes care of the rest of the sea you know so you don't see more of that but you think of the sea in terms of other things and you ask how does it affect or how does it concern a common man or how does it relate to a common man or a man who's never ever going to be near the sea is a simple thing that every second breath that we take, the fresh oxygen that we get in that breath is coming courtesy to the sea, courtesy to the ocean. So okay. that's that's one way of putting it. Okay. But to look at it another way, you know, it, it absorbs 25% of carbon dioxide that we produce. And in fact, generates 50 to 80% of oxygen. So in fact, when I said every other breath, actually I will underestimating there could be more than one breath every other other breath that we get from the from the ocean because it, of so the, how does the of ocean the, produce that oxygen for us yeah it, it basically it, it is the one which is regenerating the oxygen because of the chemical processes you know okay can you explain to me what chemical processes are at work the animals you know the yeah. activities of this what you call as a bio, bio geochemical cycle okay you know one of the simplest way of putting it is called bio. I mean, it's a complicated way, but it is bio geochemical cycles. Just as we say that the trees are producing oxygen for us. Mm-hmm. So what they are doing is they are taking in the carbon and leaving out, giving and out the oxygen. Out the, yeah. Oxygen, ocean is a huge carbon sink. Right. Okay. okay. So what it is basically doing, it is taking carbon from the atmosphere and then giving, a, giving out oxygen in the same fashion as the trees are doing. In fact, I always say that on land, we talk of trillion new trees. You know, that's our new way of thinking, as it were. You know, our whole thinking must change. Yep. So I always say trillion new trees, TNT. 
So TNT is also an explosive, as you probably know. Yes. Free nitrocholine. So we want an explosion of trees. We want trillion new trees to be to be put on to be planted on planet Earth. Uh, mangroves, seagrass, and corals are our triple insurance triple insurance against climate change. Right. Just okay. as trees, just just as trees on land, you have mangroves, we have seagrass, and we have the corals, coral reefs. And of course, you you know, being an Australian, you know about the uh, the, the the decline of the Great Barrier Reef, yes. uh, you know, area in, in Australia. So, I mean, so that is one of the richest areas in terms of production of oxygen, etc. Right. But more importantly, in terms of how it is touching the common man, uh, let me give you another example. Everything that you touch, starting from your hair to your clothes, to the microphone in front of you, anything you touch has gone across the sea, either in, in the form of raw material or in the form of finished goods. So you yeah. trade and, and shipping, and that, that's a big part of how we interact yeah. with the ocean because we rely on uh, it. And yeah. does that action, so, does the industry of shipping cause a lot of like issues with impact on the ocean? 95% of the world, tra- world trade by weight is carried by sea. So given that, the contribution of shipping to emissions or global emissions is quite small. It's only 2.5% of the total. But shipping industry is trying to get even more and more responsive to this. And they are trying to work on reducing even that contribution, you know, to a great extent. Because shipping industry is targeted because, you know, you're always thinking of them as this huge, huge juggernaut tankers and vessels, you know, which which could be half a million tons in size and so on. And they are taking stuff from A to B. You know, the sinister thing that I want to mention here is because just as I say, 95% of stuff is carried by, by the sea. There is what we call as maritime, maritime slavery. Maritime slavery is rampant. So I'm coming to a human rights issue there. So maritime slavery is rampant and there are currently estimated to be anything up to 50 million people in one form of maritime slavery, either in the fishing industry or in the shipping industry or in the uh, cruise line industry or whatever. So literally, if you take those two things into account, well, on the one hand, I said everything you touch is touch, it has gone by sea. It is also very likely that everything you touch is touched by slaves. I, so it's I, a very sad I, thing to think of. It is absolutely it's very sad. I think that, that a lot of people or- have difficulty because it's... Um, I mean, that there's a sense of powerlessness about, you know, like you can't just not buy things. So I, I, I feel very sorry to say this, but, you know, most of the stuff that we touch has been touched by slaves at some point in time. But there are two more examples I want to give you about the connection of the ocean to the common human being. The recognition that most of us know, I mean, we study in our school texts that ocean is 70% of the Earth's surface, right? We know that. Yep. But... It is 97% of all the water. Water makes the earth livable. If there was no water on earth, you would be Be like the moon. You'd be like the moon. You know, you'll be very hot in the the daytime, very cold during the night. There'll be be no climates and there'll be no weather and there'll be no weather patterns and there'll be no rains and rainy season and hot season and cold season, all those things. And the range of temperatures which allows us to exist on the earth is because the earth's water is in the ocean. But more importantly, 99% ocean offers 99% of living space. We think that, oh, you know, we got 8 billion people and so many animals and trees and everything on land, but mm-hmm. ocean has got 99% of living space. If you take the volume by volume, because yeah. ocean is deeper, deeper than mounted Everest is. Mariana's right. trench is over 11,000 meters. Right. Okay, so you know the, most of our life is going to be so, in so the there's ocean more as well. species. So there's more species in the ocean than we can ever think of have on the earth, on the, on the land, as it were. You know. Yeah. And most importantly, the exact thing that you and I are doing now, this communication on from you in Australia and me sitting here in India, you know, with, in my mother's house. Now this is something that is possible because of underwater cables yeah. and most of us 
Most of us think that these underwater cables are few and far in between, but almost 99% of all the communication cables are laid under the ocean. Right. So when we, when we talk of the cloud, you know, when you say cloud storage and my thing is going through the cloud, it is not actually it's going, going to the cloud. There is very little down. in the cloud. It's, it's in the ocean. The very little. All of it is going underwater through submarine cables. So, right. So, so obviously the ocean is, is very important to everybody. Um, yeah. Would you say how is climate change impacting it? Climate change is a, is a very complicated phenomenon, you know, and which is why the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, which is the foremost authority of the body, keeps on saying that this may happen or this is most likely to happen and so on and so forth. And as a result of that, what happens are the skeptics who say, but you don't have any certainty. You keep talking about this may happen or this might happen or this, this, is, a, this is a great chance of happening and stuff like that. So, so they take advantage of that and they say, oh, you're not certain about what you're talking about. But science can never be certain. You know, if, yeah. if science became certain, then it would become a religion, you know, <laughs> but science is, science is not a religion science because you, I can be a top notch scientist today, but I could be proved wrong tomorrow. Yeah. Well, it, it grows and it improves upon itself. That's, that's the whole exactly. point of, you it. know, the famous economist Keynes used to very famously say, you know, when, when facts change, I change my mind. What do you do, sir? You know, so that's what science is all about. The science is when facts change, the scientists change their mind. Now, what are some of the big, you know, consequences of climate change? And we are already witnessing them. So I'm, I'm just putting it in a very simplistic way, really. It's much more complicated mm -hmm. than that. But hot places are going to get much hotter. Cold but places are going to get much colder. Bringing that back Wet to the, um, the ocean itself, I, I mean, are there ocean heat waves? Yes. The, in yep. fact, that is the reason the, the ocean is getting warmer for the simple reason that the, the capacity of the ocean to absorb carbon mm -hmm. is being exceeded by the activities mainly driven by our, our, our addiction, if you like, to fossil fuel. Right. Okay. As a result of that, what is happening is the, the, the ocean is not able to absorb enough carbon or carbon dioxide. And carbon dioxide is, as you know, is a greenhouse gas. That means it heats the atmosphere around us. Mm -hmm. So the longer it stays in the atmosphere, the more the atmosphere gets heated. And because the ocean is not able to absorb the carbon dioxide at the rate it used to do, you know, because yeah. I, let me let me just give you a just quick, you know, comparison. Uh, at the time of at around 1800, which was the sort of the we were sort of into the industrial revolution in the year 1800, these CO2 PPT, as it's called, parts per, per million PPM, CO2 PPM was 283. That is okay. the year 1800. Okay. Yep. Now, I was born in the year 1955. That is 155 years later. And I call myself a 314 birth person. I don't say my birth year is 1955, but my birth year is birth, birth is, was in when it was 313 or 314. So 313, take away 283 would be 30. So there was just an increase of 30 parts per million, 30 parts per million in 155 years. Yep. Okay. Now I am 66 today. And in 66 years, that 313 has gone to 418. Right. So it's increased so that's significantly. Yeah. yeah. So, so 155 years, it has changed only by 30. And within 66 years, it has changed by 105. So we knew this from 1896. In 1896, Swante Arrhenius, who was a Nobel Prize winning chemist, uh, he, he wrote a paper on global warming. And he called it the global warning. You know? Yeah. <laughs> he, he wrote a paper. So just the play of the words, you know? Yeah. So he, he wrote a paper on global warming, but he called it global warning. And the global warning was, that yes, it is on the one hand, it is the carbon dioxide which makes the earth livable. Because if we didn't have this atmosphere, which was taking in the heat and retaining the heat, we would be getting cold. Now, So, so ideally, we do want a balance there so that we aren't yes, going absolutely. into any extreme. So, yeah. so you, want, you want X amount of CO2 PPT in the atmosphere in order to keep us living here, keep the planet livable. Right. But because what we have done, particularly 
since even Second World War and particularly since my own birth, you know, is that we have over, overused the fossil fuels. I want to talk about like people whose industry is involved in negatively impacting the, their environment. So, for example, um, fishermen whose th- their livelihoods are mm-hmm. um, dependent on obviously on fishing and in some cases that means overfishing and things like that because that's what they have to do. So how do you convince those people to understand the climate science? There are, there are three, three what you call protagonists involved in this or stakeholders as it were mm-hmm. so it's the public in it's you and me okay individuals yep and that is a huge so eight eight billion of us the second stake group of stakeholders which also involves us is uh is the corporates the corporations so if it is fishing it's the fishing companies the fishing organizations fishing fishing bodies or whatever and the third is again us. so it's all humans it's all it's all of us yeah. all those three stakeholders are humans but one is one group is the consumers the second group is the producer or the corporations etc and the third group is the policy makers so for each of these things that we want to do for for, for protecting the environment or making people aware etc so what i do for example is also making people aware through education so i would call myself an educator a consultant and a speaker you know so the but that is to make people aware of things bringing education awareness so each one according to me has got to be an agent of change and the more privileged you are the more of an agent of change you have to be the second group comes to industries they have to be self regulating so this is what part of their corporate social responsibility you know so this overfishing and is hap- or, or any of those things that are happening why are they happening? There is no end to greed. Our needs are limited. Our greeds are unlimited. Mahatma Gandhi used to say, there is enough in the world for the need of everybody, but not enough in the world for the greed of anybody. And the biggest responsibility is on the policy makers. The biggest responsibility is on the policy makers, your, your lawmakers in your own country and, and at the international level. Yep. Now, people have got to say that you know, they have to take unpopular decisions. Now, the, of course, we live in a world where politics is populism. You know, politics is two things. Politics is big money politics. India is, you know, very much a, a part of that. United States is very much a big money politics country. And our politicians are forced, irrespective of whether their intentions are good or not, the politicians are forced by various lobbies to take decisions that are popular so that they will get elected the next time, but more importantly, so that they will get the funds to stand for the next election and fight the next election and win it, you know. So these three responsible groups have got to change their thinking. And as we already know that there are places having immense disasters around the world now, much more than 10, 15, 20, 50 years ago. Yeah, in terms of you see forest fires, in terms of tsunamis, in terms of earthquakes, in terms of storms and uh, various cyclones, etc. So there's much more. And in fact, temperatures, I mean, you, you would have heard that Vancouver, which, which has been listed as one of the most livable cities in the world for decades, has now had temperature of 50 degrees Celsius. You know, this is this not pleasant. You know, 50 <laughs> degrees Celsius. You know, and there are many places around the world which are just going to become unlivable. When people who are actually suffering, they, they will probably die or they, they, they will have a desperate future. But then they are the ones who are also producing the food for you. They are the ones who are producing the fish for you. So if they, don't, they are not there, what are you going to eat and drink and live? You know, how, how is that going to affect your lives? So people have to think that we, we might be the rich people or the well-off people might be at the top of the food chain, as it were. You know, but if everything but if else the dies, food, then if, if there's no food eat. chain, yeah. if there's no food chain, you can't eat money. You know. <laughs> <laughs> yep. I mean, it's just yeah. a made-up number, really. So. <laughs> exactly. I mean, we are, we always talk of rights. You know, everybody talks of their rights, but equally, we have to think in terms of our responsibilities, and that's yeah. that's very crucial. I mean, they so, come paired together. You get you have rights and responsibilities as a part of society. Yeah, rights and responsibilities be. must must go in ha- must go hand in hand. Actually, how 
effective have bands like um, those on like plastic cutlery and straws and bags? Um, how have they been? Is it too early to tell or? I want to be a little bit controversial uh, here because, I mean, it, you know, it's, it's a great thing for you and I to go to the beach and have a beach cleaning day and say that, oh, I've collected so much plastic and blah, 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 and all that. And plastic, I'm not, I'm not trying to uh, uh, underplay the problem. Plastics are a huge, huge problem because only about 10% of plastics ever produced is recycled. And the other thing I forgot to mention about uh, on the negative side, of us, I, I was talking about the positive side of the ocean, 80% of all waste, I'm not talking about just plastic waste, 80% of all pollution that we produce on land ends up in the sea. In the ocean, yeah. Yeah. A big problem in the as ocean, well. again. Not, not, not oceans, ocean. Yeah. No, 80%, 80% of all the pollution that we produce ends up in the ocean. Now, plastics is not, uh, you know, different. All, all of the plastic eventually ends up in the ocean. And then that causes immense amounts of problem in the sense that there was a recent study conducted that in, uh, that in say, something like a, four or five decades time, they say that there'll be more plastic in the ocean than the fish, you know, if right. you don't, if you don't. But having said that, you know, although plastic looks like a big problem and it's also one of those things, you know, that makes the consumer like, you know, you tell people that, oh, you know, switch off the light or make sure that you don't throw any waste anywhere or you, you, you know, you, when you, when you recycle glass, put the green colored box in one box and, red colored in the other and the blue colored in the other mm-hmm. one you know it's just to make us feel good you know it's a feel good factor for an individual because oh i have done something for the environment but then one day i asked my, my local recycling uh, uh, company in, in 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 england and i said why do you re- uh, you know put these bottles in different color boxes what do you do with them he said no we just take them all and put them in one glass recycling thing then i said why do you put them in green red and uh, you know brown and uh, whatever clear glass he said no that is for you and i to feel good about it that yes i have done something for the environment you know i, so, I have heard uh, that like so, all of the plastic that we do put in recycling bins and so yeah. forth it most of it just gets thrown out like regular rubbish as well and not only that and I, I i have a friend who is who is a very wealthy person through plastics you know he's now he's now retired now but he, he became a multimillionaire through plastics and he told me that sunil all plastic can be recycled. You know, mind, mind this. He said all plastic can be recycled. But what happens is some plastic costs more to recycle than the other. And the industry wants to cut corners. And they don't want to recycle everything. They only want to recycle what they want to recycle, which is profitable for them. Yeah. And what is not profitable for them, that is going as waste and that is ending up in the ocean. But okay, let's come back to a different problem which, which you are not asked about. That yes, plastic is a problem. But plastic is not actually even a minuscule problem if you take a look at the big problems that we have. What are some other big picture problems that that you think are more important? We've been having COVID for the last couple of years now from 2020, you know, and COVID is a huge problem, right? It's affecting all of us. It's affecting business. It's affecting health, everything, everything. But if you look at COVID as a tiny berry, you know, a small berry, Climate change, which we've been mostly talking about, mm-hmm. can be compared to something like an apple or an orange. Okay. Right. So a little bit, little bit bigger. But then there is a bigger problem, which we haven't even touched today at all. And that is disruption of nitrogen cycle. Okay. What's that? Okay. Disruption of nitrogen cycle is because we are putting excessive fertilizers and chemicals in our lands to get more and more food production and guess where all that fertilizer and chemical is going to uh, ending up in it's ending up in the ocean oh in the ocean right of course yeah. as a right. result of that so it, it causes what we call as uh, eutrophication you know you see the foams on water bodies and that is because there's too much nutrient is there okay. and that too much nutrient gives you when you go to some um, still water, you sometimes get the smell of rotten egg, hydrogen sulfide yep. coming out. So that is the kind of water which is not absorbing any CO2. It is not producing any oxygen, but it is giving out hydrogen sulfide because there's too much nutrient there. So that is happening because of two or three reasons. One is the loss of trees, loss of vegetation cover on land. 
and loss of mangroves and sea grass and corals in the sea because those are the ones that will absorb the nutrients covid is a berry climate change is an orange or an apple and disruption of nitrogen cycle is bigger it's like it's, a, it's papaya. a papaya wow okay so it's it's but huge but then issue. there is a bigger problem but okay. there is a bigger problem than that so leave alone covid we got these three existential issues or i call them climate change disruption of nitrogen cycle and wait for it the third one and that's the loss of biological diversity and let me give you one small example on the earth and i'm not talking about the ocean here of all the mammals that we have 8 billion of us are, are mammals right so all the animals that we have 60% by weight are farmed animals animals yeah. that we are growing for our meat and our dairy product 36% is us human beings 8 8 billion human beings and there's only 4% that are wild animals wow so all your tigers and kangaroos and koalas and monkeys and you name all of them and they are all only 4% and that was not the case you know yeah the world, obviously not the, yeah the the world had more of the wild animals and less of the domesticated animals and less of the human beings So um, what happens they, if they, if biodiversity dies out? It's what you call as the the web of life, you know. So you need each species has a purpose, you know. I'm told that mosquitoes have no purpose. Maybe I'll take that for granted because I, I I'll be happy to eliminate mosquitoes. But every species has a purpose. Now we are losing, for example, bees in a huge number. Mm-hmm. If you lose bees, they are our natural pollinators. you know so right so without them of, we lose plants and and it's it's food basically it, it, it will affect our food chain our, our plants yeah. our plant life because see the, that natural phenomena that bees were carrying out of pollinating plants and making sure that the fruit was produced or flowers were produced which were then taken out and you know seeds were dropped here and there by birds and so on all that is going away when i was little in india when i grew up in india i was i was here until 33 years of my age first 33 years next 33 years in, in england so now next 33 years god knows where anyway but but third, i saw i used to see lot of sparrows in india house sparrows i don't see a single house sparrow now my 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 mother's house is lucky in the sense she is surrounded by a tiny garden and lots of different birds come but i have i'm yet to spot i have been here now for 3 months and i'm yet to spot a single sparrow right they just all the sparrows gone. are gone yeah on the other on the other scale all the vultures have gone oh, you know the what sorry vultures oh vultures. vultures yeah yeah all the vultures have gone right and they have gone because of the medication that was given to bo- cows for against bovine tb mm mm-hmm. you know all because we have like i said we have too many farm animals yeah you know and all these farmed animals are susceptible to bovine tb so to protect the cows from bovine tb they were given the tb inoculation and when they die the vultures eat them and that is a lethal carcinogenic substance for the for right the so it vultures. kills them off so the entire vulture population has been wiped out and they were the natural scavengers yeah when an animal died they finished it you know they finished it to the bare bone to the bare bone they ate everything and now yep. what happens is when an animal dies it is contributing to the nitrogen fixation nitrogen cycle because the animal is now then, then getting contributed to the water or to the soil and yeah. there's excess excess, excess nutrients. nutrients there yeah excess nutrients you know you see we see you see what i mean so the I, natural I do, scavengers yes. yeah so the nat- so the whole thing is connected which is why it is called biogeochemical cycle you know so it's biological cycle geological cycle and chemical cycle Mm-hmm. and they are all ruling us and we are disrupting them are there any things that people are doing right now out in the world that give you hope for the future that we're going to improve things and get things better right now one of the things that that i i, sh- I should mention is that the ocean is vast mm-hmm. and only about 5% of the ocean has been mapped so the more we know about the ocean the better so in 2021 in january there's something called the united nations decade for ocean sciences so that that is one positive 
step in the positive in, in the right direction yeah just but understanding more other, about it yeah but understanding more about it so that if we understand more we will legislate better if we legislate better we'll have better policies and if you have better policies and if we, if we implement them well then there is something on the positive side there's there's a light at the end of the tunnel as we say you know but the other thing is our thinking process has to change again going back to my original you know yeah. point about our whole thinking has to change our old narrative was the ocean is too, too big to fail you know we have heard this you know we we say things are too big to fail like the banks you know when the banks went bankrupt they were too big to fail too so big to fail yeah you know yeah so governments bailed them out so that means what people said in the 18th and the 19th century was anything that we do to, we can do anything to the ocean and nothing will happen you know that we can't we impact can, it we can't yeah we it's, can't, it's, it's too, too big. big i'll give you i'll give you an example thomas huxley th huxley who was the president of the royal society in the 19th century late 19th century 1884 1883 1884 he was the president of the royal society and he carried the age old notion coming from the father of uh, father of the law of the sea uh, uh, that uh, fish it can be taken at infinite at infinite sum that means you can take as much fish today tomorrow day after and you can still have so much fish to fish later on there's an But infinite know, supply no of course not yeah, yeah. so it, so basically fish was endless they said you know so so that that he said that in 1883 and in 1884 he changed his mind because again you know scientific papers came out mm-hmm. his own friend his own friend came out and wrote a paper against him and he agreed with it so he changed his mind agreed with his detractor and said no sorry i made a mistake okay so in 1884 they knew that fish could not be taken infinitely so that whole idea that ocean is too big to fail is a myth and that that narrative has to change then the second narrative came you know the second narrative is the defeatist narrative the second narrative says that the ocean is too big to fix now now people say that oh we done hard. the damage it's yeah. too hard to do anything about it you know it's too 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 big to fix and that's the wrong narrative also so the right narrative the correct narrative has got to be the ocean is too big to ignore so yeah yeah the, uh, of, the way we yeah. think of things it, it has to change we can't the status yeah. quo cannot continue we've we've got to change and yeah. we've got to change fast most importantly the change has got to come from within you know yes on some level and definitely I have, a, i have a nice i have a nice anecdote about it you know so uh, the the i mean this is like uh, our uh, dalai lama goes to get a pizza from a pizza parlor <laughs> okay and he order he orders a pizza so the the man at the counter he says sir what sort of pizza would you like so dalai lama in his usual sort of uh, philosophical as well as funny he's a very funny man so in a funny philosophical philosophical way he says make me one with everything you know <laughs> in a very philosophical yeah, make yeah, me yeah, one yeah. with everything you know <laughs> so like you know with the god and this and yeah, yeah. then that philosophical make me one with everything so anyway he orders the pizza <coughs> and then he pays the man you know he pays him a 50 dollar bill and then uh, the pizza comes and when the pizza comes he is waiting for the change he has not got the change from the 50 dollars so he, he thinks maybe he'll just sit stand and eat the pizza and then ask for the change so then he eats the pizza and the change is still not coming so then the, he asks the young man there he says young man what about my change and the young man says sir the change must come from within <laughs> because he said no make me one with everything so he's you know yeah you know, yeah so he said one thing one up on him so he yeah. said the change must come from within do the right thing because it is the right thing to do yeah so you and i you know we we know what is good and what is bad you know i always give this example to people let's say you are going in a, in your car and you have, your car is full of some trash and there is nobody watching you there are no police cameras there are no cameras you know anywhere and if you check out some trash from your car and throw it what you call as you know uh, fly tip fly tipping so if you throw some rubbish out from your car who is to know nobody will know is it yeah but, but you'll know. know you but you but you know yeah. exactly yeah. so so when you do something 
you know that you have done something wrong because we know that switching off the lights is useful using less water is useful using uh, less commodities you know being being not not gathering stuff and being spendthrift is not a good thing so we know that individually as a as an organization as a corporation they have to do the right thing not for the profits but for protecting the environment one of the politician i heard recently he said a very nice thing whether he applies that to his life, real life or not i don't know but of course politicians say things don't they and he said this very nice thing and he said every time i get up in the morning and i go to my office and i sign a paper which which is making a big decision i have put pictures of my grandchildren on the wall and i look at that picture and i say what i am doing today is that going to be good for my grandchildren yeah Now, that's that's a good yeah so how many politicians even think of that you know and that's what they should be thinking of is is the that's longevity exactly of the future forget everybody else think of your own grandchildren are they going to have enough water to live uh, drink enough i mean i i i i say this thing very often that uh, you know we live in a lawless society you know uh, and lawless not in, in with in that sense also in the sense of law also we live in a law- lawless society but we live in a lawless society in the sense that we are landless we are airless and we are waterless you know because our lands are less productive because of this nitrogen cycle disruption that i have told you about right okay our air is unbreathable because of the ppt level uh, ppm level that i have told you about in pune 250 450 in delhi and so on you know yep. so our air is unbreathable and our water is undrinkable not only that our water is not available to drink forget about undrinkable there are yeah. many places what there are extreme I water shortages it. yeah so so that's that's what i mean by lawless society we are landless airless and waterless you know it's it's how, that how change that from is. people's narratives and their ideas about how the world works they need to change yeah absolutely all right well i yeah. think that that's we've we've definitely gone over time um yeah. but i think- can i can if i may if i may i i want to make one last point okay if i may uh and thank you for your for your generosity um uh, i want to talk about something called the pin diagram you know and this is this is really at the heart of this again our whole thinking has to change mm-hmm. now pin diagram is about position issues and needs this is going back to needs greed etc yep so we have if you if you look at uh, if you know oceanic atolls you know the the the, the little mount sea mounts as we call them yep so uh, only a tiny bit of them shows above they are like icebergs only the tip shows above and most of them are most of it is under, under the sea mm-hmm. under the sea yeah hawaii for example any of those you know uh, oceanic islands so what you see at the tip is the position so we are we human beings we take position you know we are all very uh, uh, very proud of our profession or whatever so i am a policy maker or lawyer or scientist or doctor or engineer or whatever and i take a position our positions are intransigent you know farmers are important fishermen are important politicians are important so we take those positions <clears throat> but if you see the so that, that's individuals We, we are all islands by ourselves if you see what what i mean you know yeah. no man is an island as famously you know so we are all islands on our own we, we are all independent and very proud people but if if you go a little bit down <coughs> if you go a little bit down you will see the issues issues are what issues are same we all need to breathe we all need to drink we all need to get clothing we all need to get a house and so on you know so the issues are similar we all want to be happy is yep. that right we want yeah, to be healthy yeah of course it is yeah and so on. so so the issues are the same so but they are underneath you don't see those mm-hmm. and if you go further down the 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 very base of that sea mount or the atoll and those are the needs and the yeah. needs are what i mean our our former prime minister indira gandhi illustrious prime minister of india she used to often say roti kapda and makan so roti is food kapda is clothing and uh, makan is shelter Yeah. all of us that's our basic need whether you are a billionaire or whether you are a pauper the basic thing that you need is food clothing and shelter yes. oh thank you very much for ha- for joining us today um really I'm, appreciate I'm it i'm delighted yeah